When were you first introduced to music and how? My father, um, who didn't, didn't talk a lot, and he didn't, I never actually caught him listening to music, but he did have a, you know, a, um, a gramophone, a 78 RPM yeah. thing with these needles, brass needles. And he had a, a few, not, not a vast collection, but a small collection of, of big band wartime jazz. So it was all the, um, you know, Count Basie, um, Duke Ellington, um, blah, 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 all, all that era of music, which was something that I was allowed um, very carefully to play. To play on his um, on his seventy eight RPM records, and I didn't know what I liked about it because the only music I'd heard prior to that was really church music, and maybe a little Scottish folk music since I grew up in Scotland at that time. But there was it was some undi- unidentifiable thing that drew me into this music. I, I later found out that it was syncopation, and it was very often the blues scale, yeah. and that. Um, I then heard again at the age of nine, I think, when I heard Elvis Presley's earliest couple of singles. And um, that, that struck a chord. And then by the time I was 15, I think, and I, I heard Muddy Waters and a few other guys who were making their way to Europe at that time. Muddy uh, Waters, amazing. Muddy Guy. Uh, uh, yep, exactly. They, they, were, they were being fated in European concert halls. Mm-hmm. They were happy as Larry. <laughs> but it was that they experienced going to an audience who sat there in rapture listening to them. You know, they came straight from a club on the south side of Chicago straight into the Vienna concert hall. And <laughs> what, a, what a culture shift that was. But it was the opportunity for, for people like me and, and my era, my, my, my peers in the, in the world of early music in British terms, to, um, to actually see these people play live. And, um, you know, we might have known their records a little bit, but suddenly there they were on the stage. And Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and the, all, all, the, all the guys you ever heard of right. from the British uh, music scene probably went to see these guys either playing at Croydon, Fairfield Hall, or in the Manchester yeah. Free Trade Hall, or wherever it might have been. I think we all, we all, we all managed to catch a glimpse of this for real, which, which of course then developed into the, the British blues boom that was from, I guess, 65 through early 70s. But I think you mentioned something also about classical music, and one of the reasons I'm asking about this, I was not raised with classical music. I was raised with country music. Mm. If Ernest Tubb or Hank Williams didn't sing it, I didn't know it. But I came to classical music later, and in the process of doing that, I became a fan of Handel. Uh-huh. And it's my, in doing my research, it turns out that you at least currently are sort of into Handel. Yeah, Why? yeah. I've, I, I mean, I've heard bits of Handel over the years, and including, for instance, for some weird reason, my, uh, my son-in-law, my errant son-in-law, sleazy, no-good thespian, who um, has impregnated my daughter twice, his, his name is Andrew Lincoln. He's a great guy, actually. You know, we have a lovely relationship. But um, he was the one who decided, I think, he wanted Handel's um, um, water music played at the beginning of, um, of the wedding ceremony. So that was the, the entry of the, the bride and groom, which was great. And um, just coincidental, because I thought, oh, yeah, a bit, not my favorite kind of Handel, but Handel in obviously his operatic works and some great stuff that for me is the, um, you know, when you have Bach, Handel into Beethoven, that this is the, for me, the, the great uh, right. triad of, of, of musical excellence of that, that right. great era of classical music. And you have spoken in any number of past interviews, at least in passing, about Beethoven's fifth and Beethoven's ninth. Mm. What is it about those two symphonies that captures you? I suppose the very opening uh, musical lines of Beethoven's Fifth are, for me, the classical equivalent of dum dum da, bum bum da, smoke on the water from Deep Purple, or da 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 dum dum chicka ching chicka ching from Led Zeppelin. You know, if you can, if you've got a great idea and you can manage to put that across in five or six notes, then there is a good chance that that's going to. Uh, outlive you by centuries. And I think there will be, and 
if we're still here in hundreds of years' time, um, people will still look to Smoke on the Water and Led Zeppelin and Beethoven's da 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 da. I mean, he he got it. He got it. He got it in two notes. Really, <laughs> the rest of us, you know, we're, we're, we 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 fool around a little too much. It sometimes takes us maybe five notes or even six to get a good riff together. But we're running out of riffs, you know, just like we're we're running out of good air to breathe and running out of a lot of planetary resources. We're running out of good riffs. They're very hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to take your word for it. Mm. <laughs> well, now, your first instrument was what? Guitar? Yeah, like everybody, I was... Um, I, I think in, in my generation, it's hard to imagine people who didn't want to be... Well, I suppose the, 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 the folks that we, we first got to know about were probably, apart from American artists, that in the UK terms, it was Hank Marvin of the, a group called The Shadows. But Hank Marvin had this wonderful clean tone on a single coil Fender Strat. Right. And that was a, a sound that captivated people that um, I think we all wanted to be Hank Marvin to begin with. And then somewhere along the line, we probably heard Eric Clapton and wanted to be him. And when I heard Eric Clapton, I wanted to be a flute player because I knew I was never going to be able to match so Eric Clapton's skill and ability. Said, Look, I can't yeah. be Hendrix yeah. or Clapton. Yeah. yeah, and it didn't necessarily have to be the flute. It's just that I knew I wasn't going to be in that league as a guitar player. Mm -hmm. not, not without another few years, which I didn't think I had. But when you were transitioning to the flute, did the thought cross your mind, maybe the flute won't fit in the rock and roll? Mm. Yeah, but then like a lot of things, it's, um, you know, square pegs in round holes are just there to be defied and beaten into shape. So I found a way to make the flute work by, I suppose, not being taught to play the flute by just picking it up. And then I, I couldn't get a note out of it for some months, in fact, about four months before the penny dropped. Somebody said, it's like blowing into the top of a, an empty beer bottle and it will produce an, a resonant note. And suddenly I got a note. I think it was a G. And I thought, wow. And then I, I got an F and then I found an E and then I, and then I had the pentatonic scale and I could play the blues, and, I, and because I played guitar a bit, then improvising right. was was it kind of came fairly naturally. So within about two or three weeks, I was playing the flute on stage, and um, people were going, "Oh, that doesn't belong in a blues band." But you know, I, I found a way to make it work by singing and grunting the the notes in a very forceful way, which um, they wouldn't teach you if you went to your music teacher to say, "Teach me how to play the flute." They're not going to teach you that stuff, with good reason, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> 